It's Torah talk. 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 We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. A Torah Institute podcast. <laughs> it's the Torah Zone. Hey! Let Shall me turn I? off. I'm never ready. <laughs> okay. Now, can you hear me okay? Yeah, wonderful, brother. Shalom. Awesome. Shalom. Welcome to Jerusalem. Yes, isn't it? it isn't it absolutely amazing? Ah. We're at, look, look there. That's the shrine of the book. Is that right? Yeah. Well, you know, that reminds me of something. What? Well, you know, flying saucers. <laughs> yeah. Na, 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 na. Yeah, a little bit of that. A little bit of X Files. Yeah. They're out there. No, it's yeah. uh, the truth is out there, but actually, it's the Torah that's out there. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I want to obey. Yes. Remember those little cards I had made up? Yeah, that would great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Yeah. Or good evening. Yeah, it's good evening. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. wonderful. I'm having my second cup of radio coffee. Beautiful. Yeah. It's wonderful to be on location again, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Torah Talk. And the Torah Institute has sent us to the Shrine of the Book Museum in Yerushalayim. Beautiful. Now, what is uh, what is in that shrine, you suppose? Uh, some Dead Sea Scrolls? Yes, that's about all I know. I had a quick look today on YouTube, sifting through some things, but uh, you could probably... what What is in there? I know it's got the the, the... the scrolls that I saw behind the glass, they look like modern Hebrew. But you uh, reckon there's Paleo-Hebrew too, is there? Well, yes. In fact, in the various caves that were found, they found these jars where the Israelites for probably not just decades, but for centuries, were retiring worn out scrolls because they had the name written on them. Mm. And that's why they were not, that's why they were preserved. They didn't destroy any documents that had the name written on them, including business contracts, letters, or whatever the case may be. And these uh, scrolls are included, of course, scripture. And that's where we've actually found some of the older copies, oldest copies of prophets that, like, for example, uh, the books of Hanak or Enoch. You know, wow. that's cool. Uh, anyway, Hebrew is, uh, of course, written in the opposite direction from English. It's written from right to left. So as you're building a word, uh, the letters are written down and then the, ne the next letter goes on the left, you know. So they had such, uh, they placed such importance on Yahuwah's name yeah. that they, they wouldn't even throw out anything that it was written on. Right. One of the things that people uh, would appreciate is the fact that the government uh, and the Antiquities Department of Israel thinks so highly of those documents that they've actually put in an automatic system where everything, if there's a nuclear attack, everything goes underground, you know. In this museum Probably. here? Yeah. Oh. Everything goes underground. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, they can't lose such precious items. Hmm. And uh, many of this, there are a lot of the original things that are in other places, but uh, they've made copies of everything as well. Yeah. They photographed yeah. everything. They used to put it on microfiche, you know, the old style thing from the 60s and 70s, yeah. and libraries were going to that. But then they found out that those films deteriorated, 
within a matter of, uh, you know, 50 years or so. Mm. So, you know, because the, the microfish is just a film and it becomes brittle and with use and they put it on wheels or, or spools and they, and then people could scroll through them, you know, yeah. anyway, uh, that, uh, that shrine of the book, the word shrine and the word book in the Hebrew, uh, shrine is hekel, which we get the word temple from. Mm. So it's mm. hekel. And then the word book in Hebrew is sephar. Mm. So it's mm. hekel sephar, the shrine of the book. Wow. Hekel sephar. Hekel sephar. So it's gigantic hekel sephar. Gigantic hekel sephar. That's oh, great. Boy. I found a scripture with the word heckle in it. Uh, where is it? it well, is they do a lot of that here uh, whenever politicians start talking. They start <laughs> heckling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Psalm 138. I give you thanks with all my heart before the mighty ones. I sing praises to you. I bow myself toward your set apart heckle and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth, for you have made great your word and your name above all. Yes, that. that's so awesome. We, we went over that in the War in Heaven seminar just a few days ago, yeah. and we used that yeah. at least twice in the seminar. You know, I'm so surprised that Harshatan has allowed this place here to, to stay here. Like, There's got to be people that aren't happy, mainly him. That there's proof of Yahuwah's name. Well, right in the middle of this huge center area uh, is, you know, uh, the public can go up and look at this thing behind glass. It's actually in a gas environment that's preserving it. I don't know if it's got a vacuum or uh, some sort of other gas to preserve it. But you're right, it is a modern Hebrew scroll of Yeshiyahu or Isaiah. It's called the Great Isaiah Scroll. And in that document, the uh, letters of the words are written in modern Hebrew, the Aramaic square script. But wherever the name occurs, they have preserved it as the copies were made with the Paleo or ancient form of the name. So the four letters of the name are written among those other words in a different script. Oh, I didn't... On I didn't look close enough. <laughs> well, you know, when Wilhelm Wolfhart was, you know, the director of ISR from South Africa, who's now in New Zealand, he uh, went to Jerusalem and he emailed me excitedly. He said, Lou, I saw it. I saw the ancient Hebrew. And at that time, it was just re recent for him that he even heard about the Paleo Hebrew. Uh -huh. The ISR board of directors had not even heard of such a thing. And uh, anyway, it's all part of the restoration, you know, yeah. and we're all learning, and it's wonderful. Uh, for example, the first letter in his name is a yod, mm. and of course it looks mm. like an apostrophe in the modern Hebrew, but in the ancient Hebrew it looks like this. Yeah. You know, now in the Samaritan script, the letter yod, which by the way means hand, and uh, it kind of... Uh, depicts the forearm and the hand. Yes. You see, that's what this is. Now, in the Samaritan or Shomeron script, on the Lost Lunas, Lost Lunas stone, it's shaped like this. Mm. It's very similar, but yeah. it's a little different. That's how we know that it's Samaritan. And little subtle differences in the way they wrote the letters. So that's the way it looks on the Samaritan stone. Can you see it okay? Yeah, great. Great. Now, we'll, we'll forget that for a moment. Then, we're going to return back to this. This is the first letter of his name. It means, and it has a numeric value of 10. Mm -hmm. And the second letter. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, remember what I told you this means in Hebrew. The letter actually stands for a hand. Uh, forearms, you know, it isn't just the hand, it's yeah. the forearm and the hand, you know, yeah. which is interesting yeah. because that's where the nails went. 
Mm. The nails went mm. here. They didn't go in here. Mm. You know, it would have ripped out. They put the nails in between these two big bones in the, in the Messiah's hands. Now, this is uh, the second letter of the name. And it's written, of course, this is the first letter. And instead of going this way, we have to go to the left. And that's the hay. And that means window. And, you know, the eyes are windows. There's two of these in the name. Mm. Yes. Now, the third letter, which is the most mysterious letter of all, is the ua, which they've been calling a wa, wa, a wa, you know, like wa, wa. That's a trombone, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sort of a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is a ua. Because it operates in almost all cases as a U or an O, you know? And uh, you'll hear this in all kinds of names. And I'm going to show you one of them or two of them here. But this is the third letter of the name. And you see how that's building up there? You see that? Now, what's really going to be fun is we only have one more letter. And it's, well, it's another one of these. Yeah. And it... When you put them together, of course, it looks like what I have on my shirt here. It looks like this. You have a yod, a hay, an ua, or a wa, which will show you that that's actually an errant pronunciation. And a hay. Yod, hay, ua, hay. Can you yeah. see that okay? Yeah, that's All right. crystal clear. Great. Great. Anyway, I used the magic marker just a few minutes. That's why I was a minute late. I was trying to finish up a few of these little things here. These are old uh, documents that we had from a long time ago that we just used for scrap paper. Yeah. Now, they wouldn't throw these away because the name's written on it. Nice. Now, here we go. This letter is found in this word also. Now, I want you to see these two things together because it's hard to understand. But uh, the four letters that you see here are found. There goes that fish again. He's looking for that that prophet. Remember? <laughs> yeah, he's upset. Anyway, yod Hey ua Hey. that's the name of the creator, found at least 6,823 times, by the way, in the Tanakh. The Tanakh is an acronym for Torah, Nabiim, and Kethubim, which means the Law of the Prophets and the Writings. Anyway, there it is. Now, look at this letter. Look at this word down here. This is the same word right here. I mean, a similar word. This is the name of Leah's fourth son. The tribe was named after him, Yehuda. They've corrupted it to Judah and finally Jew. All the people that descend from Yehuda, you know, are today, they're called Jews. But look at this. There's that Yod. Can yes. you see it? Yes. Now, now, look at the name. You can see the name, except for this triangular letter. The name is intact right there in Yehuda's name. In fact, his name means a praiser or worshiper of Yah. See, Yahu. Now, this has a Daleth in it. The Daleth is the, uh, let's see, that's the a fourth letter in the word now. Instead of having the hay there, they've jabbed this Daleth in, okay? Now, Yehuda is the way you say it. And you, I've, I've transliterated it up here, and I've underlined the equivalent tetragrammaton, or four letters. Yod, hay, ua, hay. Now, that is uh, commonly mistaken to be a W. Well, what do you hear when you say the name of the letter W? Well, you're saying double U. There is no such thing in the Hebrew. That's a new letter. It appeared around the 13th century on the earth. The letter W was actually two U's. Now, where did the letter U come from? Well, the letter U came from this letter, the third letter of the name. It's not Yahuda, 
this man's name is not Yahuda. Okay? <laughs> that would be, that's for so. All right. You sound like now, a Wookiee. <laughs> well, yeah. Now, uh, it, because see, corruption of the, the Hebrew has been a, a living language and it has been evolving. Yeah. So it's changing yeah. with use. That's why there's a V in the language now, but there wasn't before. But you, these three letters right here in our alphabet, U, V, W, all, all occur next to each other. Now, where did they come from? Well, this letter produced all three of these letters. And you can look this up on Wikipedia or other online dictionaries. Do some research because the, the third letter of Yahuwah's name is even more difficult for people to get than any of the letters. And the letter U evolved from this letter because when it went into, when this letter went into, when this letter went into Greek, it became the Greek upsilon, not a V, but an U, the upsilon. You know, you see the shape didn't change at all. Now watch this. When this letter went into Latin later, it lost this stem right here. See, the lower stem was lost. And it became the V shape. But it wasn't a V. It was operating as a U. Like in the, the word in Latin for sword, like a gladiator's sword, is the word gladius. And they, they spelled it with a, with a V shape, but they operate, it operated as a U. And for hundreds and hundreds of years in the recent times, that V shape was written on stones and things like that. And it represented a U. Hmm. Gladius. That's the word for sword in Latin. Anyway, the, this letter is the same thing as a U. And that's why these three letters right here all come from this, this one letter over here, but originally looking like this. Went into the Greek, see? And then it went into the Latin without the lower stem. That's a pretty big thing to overcome because when you go back and you understand what they were writing in the, in the 1500s, like this word, Petra, Petrus Galatinus, I believe it was, uh, came up with this transliteration. And this transliteration actually is the same thing as our pronunciation today of Yahuwah. Because this is not a V to them. It's a V to us, but it isn't a V to the people of the 15th, 1500s. They were seeing this as Hua. They were seeing Hua. They weren't, this is a diphthong, a dipping of the tongue. People don't get diphthongs anymore. They, uh, that's too... You know, I mean, we're into like all this, you know, Ebonics and stuff, you know. But uh, this is actually technically the way it worked. And there's the four letters of the Tetragrammaton. It's a Yod, and they gave the, the, the iota in the Greek a, um, a tail because it was at the beginning of a, of a, you know, around 1530. They just started developing this shape. But it still operates like in the name of the country, Yugoslavia. It, it's spelled with this letter, but it's pronounced as a Y. You know, Yod, He, Ua, He. And they were pronouncing it, Ya, Hua. That's what they were, that's what they were saying. Hmm. Not Yahua, but Yahua. And I'm going to show you one other thing, which I didn't have time to prepare for. But look at this. I feel like I'm teaching kindergarten, but... That's uh, great. It's going to be amazing. Uh, one of the uh, circus fathers was aware that the name was very important. His name was Clement, you know, of Alexandria, the catechetical school of Alexandria. He was one of the headmasters. This is the way he pronounced or transliterated the name Yah in Greek letters. See, Iota and then Alpha. So we have that. Uh, ya is the way they said it. They didn't say Ia. They said Ya. Now watch this. Here we go. This is wonderful. 
<laughs> yeah. This is going to be fun for people that are just starting out and they really love the name. This is going to be and even I'm, better for people on the radio. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, they're not going to get it wrong. I mean, that's, that's a good thing we have uh, faces for radio. Yeah. But look at this. This is the way he did it. Yeah. This is the diphthong. This is O U. Ooh. Uh, Yahoo. And this is Greek, is it? This is the way Clement of Alexandria transliterated the pronunciation of the name in Greek letters. And that's pretty good because they can't do the name of the Messiah in Greek letters at all because they don't have a, they don't have equivalent letters. But there it is. So if they had uh, had, if they had foresight, or they didn't have an agenda, then the first part of Yahusha's name would be Yahoo. Mm. You know, that's what it would be. But this is the Greek letters, yeah. and uh, that's pretty exciting to figure out. But this is uh, not as deceptive as it seems. It, it was at first for me, and I uh, realized that this is not a V. This is a U. This is not a V. It's U. It's Hua. You know. It's awesome. Mm. So we have those uh, fun little things. Yeah, you're going to have to, if you all are listening to this on radio, you need to find this pic, this uh, show on YouTube so you can see these letters. We're putting them up on the camera. You know. So the, uh, everybody's pronouncing the J as in Jehovah, J, Jehovah. It's not supposed, yeah, to, be, it's supposed to be a Y, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. Because see, we've distorted it just in the last few hundred years. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. I, I've been encouraging people to not insert letters like W into the words that they're transliterating because that's going to confuse people if Yahusha tarries down the road. Because down the road, they're going to go, well, what is this W? And, and they're, they're probably not going to have the facts that we have, or they won't have, maybe they will, but with all this paperless society that we have, it's uh, likely that a lot of information will not be penetrating the veil of time. So we need to kind of get it simplified and down to its root, its, mm. its constituent points. And instead of adding in these letters that are kind of recent, uh, it's, you know, the letter V, for example, people insist, yeah, there's a letter V in the Hebrew alphabet, and they insist on using that too. And, and it's just ignorance is all it is. It's not stupidity. It's just they haven't done a, a, a source letter search, you know, to find out what, what were people thinking just a few hundred years ago. The letter V is Ashkenazic in the Hebrew. It's something recent. It's Germanic. It's something that, that was added into their uh, pronunciations and, uh, and understandings. But, you know, one of the things uh, that I find very interesting is, in uh, Yeshayahu, chapter 2811, he says, I'm going to speak to these people in, with stammering lips and in a foreign tongue and try to get them to understand. And if we read that entire passage and that whole section, you'll get the idea really quickly. Because he really wants to, to restore our, well, if you read Psalm 80, Psalm 80 is the cry of Ephraim, being, re, saying, revive us, restore us, you know, uh, so that we might call upon your name. I mean, it's, it's us. He's talking. He knows what, what's going to happen. He's, he's amazing. Yeah. yeah. When you first came into this experience and you were uh, using the name Yahweh um, and... Uh, when you were in the circus and came out of the circus and using Yahweh, what made you dig any deeper? Why, did, why didn't you stay satisfied like the majority of other, uh, whether they be Jews, Messianics, what do you, whatever they want to call them? So why did you look deeper? What was wrong with Yahweh? What, What's wrong with Yahweh well, for you? I've been researching why things are the way they are all my life, asking the question, why do we do that? What's, the, what's going on? What are you trying to hide from me? Not me, but from us. And the interesting thing about it is, see, I was studying science, and I wanted to get into the roots, and I wanted to go into the constituent parts of everything so that I could analyze why things are built up the way they are in the, in the universe and in our bodies and 
in, in the world. I was trying to understand the world with science. But uh, when I started studying scripture, about when I was 35 years old, I started a year older than you are um, right now. But uh, I didn't even read scripture uh, without having the key. See, he gave me the key first. So I had the name already. <laughs> and I was really well along and I understood what he was saying because I could I had the key. The, the name is the key. And when I, uh, well, I, I've related this before, but the first scripture that I ever read sitting in a, in a reading a book was I just opened the book, the scriptures up in the middle, and it was Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 53. And it shook me to my roots. And I had never read scripture. You know, I left Catholicism basically when I was around 18 or 19, you know, because I was in the Air Force and I, I was completely, I was sobering up from that, you know, because it's drunkenness, you know. It's just loaded with men's traditions. Anyway, the thing I did was it freaked me out so much, I closed the book and I made a commitment that I was going to read every word of this book. And I remember before I picked up the book, the reason I picked it up was I saw something sitting on top of it. And I said, we shouldn't have things sitting on top. It was on a shelf of Yahuwah's word. You know, I didn't know his name. I didn't know his name. But I, I, I knew that it was the word of the Creator. And I picked up this thing off of it. And then I just kept it in my hand. I read that. And then I said, well, when I closed it up, I said, I'm going to read every word of this. And then I started reading for the very first pages. And it happened to be an NIV. However, I read the preface. And the preface explained the translator's approach. And they said that we have removed the name and in regard to the divine name, we have removed it and put in a device in the form of all capital letters, L-O-R-D. And at that time, I did not know that L-O-R-D was the translation of the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. I didn't know that. But it upset me. And I said, wait a minute. They're telling me, because I can understand English, uh, they're telling me in the preface Anybody that looks in the NIV preface can see this. That they're actually saying that they took the name out and put in something else. They're telling you that. Mm. And they're even differentiating uh, about how the lowercase letter, L-O-R-D, is different. And it, it applies to another word. Mm. But they took mm. the name out of the scriptures. So anyway, when I would go through and read the scriptures, which I started reading the NIV, I saw all these footnotes, and I was going, wait a minute. Some of the footnotes are actually helpful, but other ones are fighting against what it says in the text above it. And I'm going, wait a minute. These people are trying to deny in the footnotes what the text is saying. And, I, you know, that didn't make any sense to me either. Why would they do that? And I was going, the text is awesome, and I love it. And he gave me a love for his word, but he gave me, like you read, Psalm 138, his name and his word are above all things, you know, and that's what, in our, in our hearts is what it means, and so our, my heart was never captured, like a lot of people are in prison in their own teachings, their, their own mindset, their stronghold, from their teachers, see, I never had teachers that were putting me in a box, so I just let Yahuwah teach me. Yes. And that was uh, that opened up everything to me. So things came fairly quickly, understanding and comprehension. When you surrender to the fact that he does have a name, not two names, yeah. but he has one name, and that makes all the difference. You know, yes. it's just a wonderful thing. But uh, how did you get the he, key? How did you get the well, key? Was it in the preface or? Prior? It was in the preface. They had the Tetragrammaton written in there as uh, English or Latin letters, Y-H-W-H. And I did not know for many years that the W was a deception as well. See, it's a W, and Whoa. it's really just a U, you know. Well, yours, a is lot of, yours, what's that? yours is good. When I was studying it years ago, 
it was JHVH. <laughs> and uh, I love studying that part. I remember it. JHVH. And we learned how to write it. And that was in modern Hebrew. If you turn the modern Hebrew upside down, it spells Lily. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I can't write it. I'm too rusty. But uh, JHVH. And it makes sense now after your explanation of Jehovah. Uh -huh. Because the J yeah. is a ya, yeah, yahua, yeah. As well as they could do it, mm. yeah, amazing. it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. So you got the you got the key of knowledge, <laughs> reading the preface of an NIV reading. scripture. NIV, yeah. Well, he, uh, I, I've always been one to pry up and look underneath whatever they're trying to hide, and I saw that they were deliberately hiding something, mm. and I went to the University of Louisville Library where I had uh, been a, a student for seven and a half years. So I was familiar with the library and I had to do this research on his name. It was the most important thing that I've ever done in that library. But I took documents and books and things that I found and I put them in, in the photocopier. And I took copies and alphabets and stuff and I took it home and studied it. And th that was the first thing. So you have to get the building blocks because you know, uh, letters are like musical notes. They're actually meant to be, uh, they're meant to be played on the on the tongue. Like our tongue is an instrument, and these are just symbols that are on paper that are like written music notes. Like it's like written musical notation. Yeah. You know, instead of little black beans with with little flags hanging off of them. Uh, and staffs and the lines and spaces, this is telling you how to pronounce the word by the individual letters. And so you just play the song. Now, if you play the song, Yahuwah, then you, then you have it. And Yehuda, which is the same four letters with the added letter D, you just take a, a, the letter D and put it right in there, and you've got Yehuda. So if you can pronounce Yehuda, then you can say Yuhua without the D. So you just take the, the note of music out. Mm -hmm. So if you can say if you can say this, play this song, Yehuda, mm -hmm. then you can also play this song without the sound of that one note. So the letters are kind of like notes. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Isn't it amazing? So, yeah. And I was trained in music too, so you know, I kind of saw the similarity and the linkage between music and written words and speech because we're actually, we're singing, we're, we're playing songs. Hmm. We're, uh, you know, in the same way a musician would play a song. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just interpreting the music. That's why uh, an orchestra can be handed manuscripts with notation on it. And they can play a song because they know exactly how fast to play it. They know what pitches there are for their instruments. And uh, they can play it together. That's the important thing. Because Ephesians 4 wants us to have unity in love. You know, and that's what Paul was writing about. He said that's the goal, you know, unity. And we can't play together in, in any way unless we uh, understand things correctly, you know, and we're taught by the teacher. You know, Yahushua's awesome. Hmm. He's, he's always with us. He said so. Yeah. He said, I'm with you always. Yeah. And so uh, he's, he's trying to teach people right now hmm. because this hmm. is part of a restoration effort, and we're all, we're part of it. Yeah. You know, now uh, Elijah or Eliyahu, is mentioned in Malachi chapter 4, and his name means Yah is Elohim. Hmm. And that's an interesting thing, because that's the very thing that he was battling over in his days when he was going against nor the northern tribe's leaders, uh, Ahab and his witch, you know, Ahab and his wife. No, it quite his well. <laughs> his wife was a witch. Uh, anyway, yeah. Sidonian princess that she was, eaten by dogs and all. The uh, well, I think the only thing left of her was her hands and feet, wasn't it? Ooh. That's strange. 
seems like that'd be the first to go, the dog. But anyway, the thing of it is, uh, the name at Mount Carmel, at Mount Carmel, which is up on the coast of Israel, right on the Mediterranean, uh, it's a little high piece of ground. Uh, Eli Eliyahu went into a, a battle with the priests of, well, there were 850 of them, uh, 450 BAAL priests and 400 priests of ASHERAH. Uh, that was the witch's, uh, she was feeding those people, you know, taking good care of them. Anyway, Eliyahu by himself took on all these 850 people. I think uh, last, uh, last week I said 950. I was wrong. It was early in the morning then too, but I got up about a half an hour early today. Anyway, the thing of it is, uh, that same thing is going on now. He said in Malachi 4, you know, that we should hear Moshe, you know, remember Moshe, his prophet, and the Torah of, of Moshe, that, that we're, that's not really Moshe's Torah, but the Torah that was given through Moshe to all of Israel. And then he mentions in the next sentence or so that he's going to send Eliyahu, the prophet, that he might turn the hearts of the fathers to, their ch to the children. And the children, of course, are the children of Israel. That's us. The, the hearts of the fathers. And it's interesting because in the war in heaven, we were talking about the heart is the mind. It's, it's, it's our inner self. So our mind has to be turned back to the truth. And that's interesting because by searching through the fathers of our, of our faith, we will find what Eliyahu was trying to tell us, that it is not B-A-A-L, it's Yahuwah that is the sovereign of esteem. Hmm. Read Psalm 24. Oh, man. Who is the sovereign of esteem? And what is his name? It even asks that, you know. And then it, I think Psalm 2 mentions it as well. Hmm. What is his name, if you know? Yes. You know. Wow. Wow. Uh, but anyway, Eliyahu is, I think, the spirit of Eliyahu is already here, just before he returns, before the great and terrible day of Yahuwah comes, yeah. that the uh, spirit and the teaching of Eliyahu will be heard across the earth, and that is, Yahuwah is Elohim, and that's uh, what we're hearing. It's not someone else. It's not B-A-A-L or L-O-R-D, which is the same word, you know, because uh, anybody that looks up the word B-A-A-L in a dictionary will see that the definition is L-O-R-D, which should strike terror in anyone's heart that is seeking truth. So we should spell L-O-R-D, should we? We shouldn't say that word? Well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're reading scripture, you should never say that word. Mm. But because it's a proper name that we've adopted that supplants or replaces the true name. But if you're just saying the word Lord, that's an English word. It's completely innocent. Mm. It, it basically means a person who is over another person. You know, it's a, a, it, it actually comes from a, an ancient... Uh, old English term, word, which means a keeper of the loaf, Hlafweird. If you look it up, you'll see that the word Lord comes from Hlafweird, and it means a keeper of the loaf. It's the one who feeds the community. It's uh, basically a feudalism thing, probably, mm -hmm. you know, where there was a Lord who owned the land. He was a landowner, a landlord, and he would have serfs that that cultivated his land, and he would receive some a portion of their, you know, labors in the form of, uh, you know, the way that giving them a home and food to eat. They would probably be the ones growing the food, and uh, but the uh, most well-fed person on the estate would be the Lord himself, you know. But one of the Another great abomination that's going on is that the titles, which that is all that is, really, is a title, but uh, they use it to replace his name. 
uh, but one of the greatest abominations, that, uh, not quite as great as this one, but it's, it's great, and that is the way that the adversary has stolen the identity of Yahuwah by putting such a term into the translations and then sending that out all over the world and, and people thinking it's a good thing, you know. And, and actually, he's stolen the identity of Yahuwah by replacing the name. He's inserted his own device in there to divert the worship away from Yahuwah. He's also got, well, by doing that, he's actually corrupted the hearts and polluted the hearts of the people he's deceived. Uh, because this one thing is the greatest stronghold to overcome far and above every other stronghold there is. A stronghold is a mental fortress that we decide to be truth when it's really not. It, it, you know, and we're believing lies, you know, or half-truths. But um, mm -hmm. it's the greatest stronghold of all. Wow. So you've explained that really incredibly simply for everybody what's the problem <laughs> why well, uh, what, what are some of the problems or the walls you've come up against with people who I'm sure you've explained it to them just as simply as that why are what are all the messianics and rabbis and things saying do they have a different book to where you've looked or why can't they seem to understand what you're saying as far as it's just four letters, and it's not hard to track the sounds like you were saying. What's the problem? It's the heart. The mind has been that an individual is going to hold on to error in, in, for a number of reasons in order to save face or because they have not been listening closely enough, they've built their foundation wrong, so they don't want to be tearing down everything that they've built. So they just keep doing what they believe. Uh, the same thing's true of the scientific community with uh, things like uh, evolution. They just don't want to tear the whole house down and start over, uh, you know, for a, a number of reasons. But uh, if, I, if I put myself in the position of a person who's stubborn, then a stiff-necked or bronze-foreheaded person, which is what Yahuwah says that they are, that they cannot be taught, they will not listen. Well, you know, it's, it, I mean, I can relate to that. Because I have those same, I'm a human being, I have stumbling blocks that I've got in my hooks and, stumbling blocks that I've got to overcome too. I'm just, I feel like I'm just starting out. But uh, if we can accept the fact that by uh, just moving a little bit more closer into the truth, we will have to be embarrassed about something that we've done before and say, well, um, ministries that, uh, that have, you know, for decades been printing the wrong, thing, wrong spellings, in less accurate spellings, they uh, they they really don't want to stop and, and say they've been wrong, you know. And uh, we're moving into new ground now because Yahushua's leading us into more truth. He said he would. He promised that he would guide us into all truth, and that's going to naturally imply that we've been doing things that are wrong. Mm. It's mm. it says in, in in the scriptures that our fathers have inherited nothing but lies and things of, that are of no profit. And uh, what are we going to do, you know? Mm. So um, we need to abandon the errors whenever we can, whenever we discover them, mm. and move into a better place and build our foundation on the truth rather than just building it upon some uh, ethereal thing that happened uh, just a few hundred years ago. Um, I mean, the letter W is a big stumbling block for people, and they're putting it in there and excusing it and saying, well, it's okay to use a W because, you know, people understand that, and they can make the sound with their lips because they can read it, and it makes more sense to them, you know. It's the wrong sound. 
Well, that sound isn't actually there at all, but it is in a transitional state. If you say Yahuwah slowly, the, the diphthong and the transition from ooh to ah gives the lips that wah, yeah. Yahuwah. That's true. But you don't need the letter W to, bring, to make the sound. It's not a, a sound itself. It's just a transitional sound yeah. between ooh and ah. Yeah. But... Yeah. Uh, now I'm sure to a lot of people this seems very uh, uh, nitty gritty and obsessive. But the thing is, you know, Yahweh, Yahuwah, big deal. What's the pro? You know, who cares? Well, you just said it's one of the biggest stumbling blocks, one of the hardest things to overcome, uh, biggest strongholds there possibly is. And you said last week, how can two people walk together if they're not in agreement? Um, and his name, you said it yourself, how many thousand, six thousand something, his name is mentioned. And if his name is the only thing that can heal people, cast out demons and, and they were getting beaten up and thrown into prison over his name, do not say this name, stop using this name, it's probably something we should ponder. And then there's that scripture too about those who fear Yahuwah and think upon his name, the book of remembrance, that one. I wrote that one down. That's Malachi 3.16. Okay. Yeah. So it's probably something that we should be obsessive about, isn't it? Yeah, if you're going to be obsessed about something, his name and his word would be a good place to be obsessive. Mm. Not to be condemning others. I mean, I hope no one feels like we're just saying, you're using that W <laughs> and you like that V. Well, no, we're, we love you. It's just, will you please listen? You know, and, you know, it's not really there. It's not like what you think. It's something new. It's something that, well, something that has changed is can be thought of as a corruption, something that is a pollutant, something that has been added or changed. And that's not a good thing to see. That's why we like to go all the way back and skip past the Greek entirely, because if you have the Hebrew, what do you need the Greek for? You know, what's, what's that about? You know, trying to prove it. With Greek, let me explain it to you with the Greek. You know, huh? Well, that's what the apostles wrote in. They did? Well, uh, they went through for centuries and centuries. The adversary was out there trying to stamp out the Hebrew. You know, burning books and libraries, entire libraries. But uh, the Alexandria Library, I think, burned three times, you know, in Egypt because it was a repository of too much truth. But you know, if uh, if they want to use the Greek, they can see that it's in it's impossible to spell with Greek letters the accurate sound of the Hebrew name of uh, Yahusha, because there's no S H. You know, Sha or Shua. Do you actually know why they say? Good morning, sister. Oh, good morning. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I, I want to say hello, and I want to. have to come in. I have to cut off that side of the screen. You have to come in. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. It's not well, easy I'm being green. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to remind Lou that he had a Torah talk question. So okay. when you get a chance, somebody actually called oh. and asked if you would discuss this question on the air. What do we do about unsaved mates? Uh, and then, and now that doesn't mean the Australian mates. Like, hello, mate. <laughs> We're talking about a husband or a wife. What do we do about unsaved mates on Christmas and Sabbath observance? Is my house cursed for having Christmas decorations? Mm. No, the house is probably not, but the object and the and the people that brought it in are in danger because you bring a, what was it we were reading last week? I think it was Deuteronomy or, or chapter seven. Mm. Do not bring a detestable thing into your home or you or an accursed thing, or you will become accursed like it. Uh, now what we have to remember though is love is the predominant thing and uh, when we're um, when our mate does not come along in a belief with us 
then uh, we are to remain with our, our, our mates and not condemn them, but guide them gently and show them that we're, you know, well, in Romans chapter 12, that's the scripture that Paul wrote to explain how we are to be operating in the world. And in a family where a husband or a wife does not love the name or does not care about anything uh, which of the truth, but rather would just be in the world, you know, pursu pursuing the, the three areas that the adversary tests us in. Um, pride of life. Yeah, the pride of life. Well, let's see, what is it? It's uh, lust of the flesh. Pleasure, possessions, and position. Those three things. When you're pursuing those things, that's what that's what gets all the politicians in front in trouble. Going to the top of the pyramid, it's it's all about you know pleasure. That's where they're getting in trouble. They can't keep their their pants their pants on. And uh, then you've got the possessions that they get. You know, all the lobbyists are going here. You go. You know, here here. Let me have this. And they're taking bribes. Well, and then there's the position. You know, I'm up here high up. And I want to be up there. I want to go higher. It's just the same thing that the adversary himself fell for, you know. But anyway, those three things. And you've got that person living in your house that you're married to, that you're one flesh with, that is completely, uh, you're yoked with something that's going, it's like having a club foot. You know, you've got, you're trying to go down the walk and you're bound to this other person and you're yoked like two oxen. Oh, it's more like a donkey and an ox together. And uh, I don't want to say which one is the donkey or the ox, but anyway, it's sad and it's and it's grueling and and it's torturous. You know, when when two animals are yoked together that are dissimilar, uh, the same thing's true of us. But we need to stay together and show the other person the love and the concern and the kindness and the heart, the fruit of the Spirit that would enable them to, to bear under this strange conflict that they're dealing with. And uh, realize that every person doesn't know how many, how many years or days or months that they have to live. We don't know. I mean, there's no way that I expect to be here another 20 years, even though I would only be 80, you know, or 81. But if I, if Yahuwah lets me live another 20 years, that would be wonderful. But that doesn't mean that I can party, you know, and do whatever my flesh wants. Yeah. I want to help people, you know, that have leprosy. You know, the lepers are, are out there. And uh, you're encountering them in the, in the food, in the grocery stores, the banks, you know, and all the places where you go for your supplies, all the places where you work. You're surrounded with lepers that are going into the lake of fire. There's no hope at all for them. And if they're doing things that are abomin abominable and detestable to Yahuwah, unknowingly, they will receive a few blows. And if they will receive correction, then they will be forgiven. But we have to warn them. You know, the, uh, the prophet Ezekiel, or Yehezkel, was told that if a person will turn from their error, that his former or her former transgressions will no longer even be remembered. But they, but they will actually be rewarded for having turned from their transgressions. But if a person that is doing good and doing the righteousness and obeying Torah, if that person turns and uh, stops obeying, then nothing that they did before will be remembered either. So they're, you know, it's equally, you could be equally uh, in, in trouble. A uh, person that uh, abandons the faith, you know, is not going to make it. But, you know, that's why he doesn't want us to go out and look for a mate or a spouse that is not of the same faith, you know, or commitment, you know, because that's, that's why Israel was commanded not to, mix marriages with the Moabites and the Ammonites and, and the Sidonians and all that. You know, you see what happened to them, you know. Even Solomon, or Shlomo, mm. he uh, intermarried 
with these pagan women, and he built them uh, shrines to their deities. And he knew better. Yeah. So do you think, anyway, yeah. Do you think Yahuwah understands then? Like uh, your unbelieving husband or wife just rocks up with a tree, says, I'm putting it there. <laughs> you can go jump. I'm doing it. Uh, you think Yahuwah understands the, the process everybody's in? Well, we know that an mm. idol, an idol is nothing at all, you know, mm. and I know that because I've got a, a few idols that my partner has assembled in the store that I work in. Uh, and no one's bowing down to them, but, uh, you know, he doesn't bring a Christmas tree in at least. A lot of retail stores actually put up Christmas trees, yeah. you know. I had a man in the store last night. I had to close last night late, and he came in the store and he said, uh, you know what you need is some more Christmas decorations in here. He was really wanting them. And I don't know if he had a demon in him or what, but, you know, it was kind of a temptation. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, Christmas decorations, eh? You think this place needs a few? And uh, he's talking to the wrong guy, you know? <laughs> well, he should have been talking to my, uh, well, I, I pray for my partner every day. You know, and maybe Yahuwah will wake him in the night or give him a, a vision in a dream and go, you better stop this. You better listen. You know, and he can do that. You know, just change his heart. Yeah. But uh, that would be great. But, you know, that's just it. Why don't they change? Well, I don't know. I mean, every little detail is right there. But the tree is actually a type of altar. I mean, witches know this. And that's why you see the obelisks and the witch hats and the steeples and the tree all represent the same thing. Yeah. And that's just four things. But they're all the same thing. Yeah. And that's why Daniel's friends would not bow down when the national anthem was being played in Babylon. They would not bow down facing the pillar. They wouldn't get on their knees and bow, mm -hmm. you know, to an object. And a lot of Islamic people are bowing several times a day to an object on the earth. They actually put a little mat down, bow down in the direction of where their object is. And it's basically a cube, you know, and they're facing what, what they can uh, understand to be an object. And that's exactly what the Babylonians were doing. And of course, uh, A-S-H-E-R-A-H is what the tree represents, you know, deity of the Sedonians. And that's what was carried into the world and, um, you know, that's the same thing that was happening in Babylon when they were kneeling to the obelisk. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an emblem of regenerative sexual power. You know, it's a phallus, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Witch hat is also a phallus. It's the same thing. It's a, the cone of power. That's mm -hmm. what this is. And I kind of shudder to think about this thing, too, when people do this. I don't get that either. I see Hindus doing it. And I, and I well, this is an ancient thing. It must have something to do with something that's pointed and, you know, yeah. it's just wrong, you know. Yeah. That's not yeah. what we're to do. We're to lift our hands, you know, into the air, into the skies. <laughs> not to worship the, the, the signs of the heavens, but mm -hmm. to know that he's everywhere, you know. Yeah. And that we're his children. And a little child will not do this when they ask for something from their father. They'll do this, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And you have to have open hands, you know. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we take nothing into this world and we take nothing out either, except the Torah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what's, you know, that gives us his life. Because Yahusha is the living Torah that he brings to us. Yeah. But uh, in the seminar, we uh, discuss the armor of Elohim, and that is the indwelling of Yahusha's spirit within our hearts. And the only offensive weapon that we have is the sword of the spirit, which is the word, the Torah itself. And when you look at the very tip of the sword, you know, the part that actually does the cutting, and we mentioned that before. He says, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. He identifies himself. 
mm. so that that tip is dangerous. Mm. It's a weapon. It's a weapon of truth. But if you take the tip off and blunt it and take the name out and put in another name, what if Eliyahu, you know, when he was when he had all these 850 prophets that had been cutting themselves, and dancing around and yelling all afternoon, and they couldn't get B-A-A-L to wake up. Well, what if El Eliyahu had built this big altar and poured water on it, and then he called into the heavens and he said something like uh, L-O-R-D or Adonai or said some, something else other than Yahuwah. Would any fire have come? The fire that has to fall upon us is is contingent upon the name, you know, because we're his his sacrifice now. I mean, we are living sacrifices, or living living slaughterings, or offerings, where our bodies are given to him for his use, and we're altars. Our tongues are altars, and if we've got the wrong name coming out. A corrupted form of the name. We want to correct it. The people that love him and love his name want to be as closely accurate as they can. Not to be judging people and go, wait a minute, you know, you've got a V in that, you know, you've got a J. Oh no. Uh, not not to unlovingly, but to guide them, guide them lovingly into the truth. And if they will accept it. And later on, maybe uh, they will. Like maybe Yahuwah will send someone else to them. They go, let me tell you about this. Let me guide you into a little more truth. And then maybe at that point, they'll say, well, I've heard this before. <laughs> He's coming after you. And he will keep coming after you. He's not going to give up on you. And he does love you. Even in your error, he loves you. You know, don't think that we, and that's why it's so important that we don't judge one another for anything, because he loves us, he died for us while we were still sinners, and all we have to do is just simply acknowledge that he redeemed people that we can't seem to even get along with, but we have to love them, because, you know, if we don't love the redeemed, yeah. then we aren't redeemed, we're not redeemed, we're just judging, you know, we have to be very careful. So uh, people that need a little help, that are a little in a little different place in the race, we have to go, come on, come on. And we're not here to run ahead of them. We're here to slow down if necessary and guide them and say, come on, you know. That's uh, almost like a flying saucer. Yeah. Because it, it is something that reminds me. It's, it's actually this big thing behind us is – emblematic of the top of a jar it's a it's a it's the lid of a of a jar uh, the type of lids that were found in the uh, dead sea scrolls mm. and it's actually not a flying saucer <laughs> yeah well i just remembered i uh, uh -huh. spoke to chris a couple of hours ago while uh, my apprentice was uh, waiting to shut up shop and uh he said, we just watched last week's Torah talk, and he said, the thing that amazed me was when Lou said about the protecting Malachim, and we all have one. And he said, that just blew me away. He said, uh, and he said, Mark, did you realize there's somebody there watching you all the time, everything you did? I said, the information went in, but I don't think I realized it like you're saying it, mate. He said, well, tell them all that. There's somebody watching you all the time, standing there watching you. And we know you who are is, but they're, they're all watching us. All, all the, every single move you make, all the things you do when you think no one's watching, they're watching us. That, that blew his brains out. That's amazing. Even when you're sleeping. Yeah. Mm. You know, mm. See, they don't sleep. And Yahuwah doesn't sleep. He's just sitting there going, Oh, I love that little guy or that little girl. And that's what we are to him. We're just little children. Mm -hmm. And he just loves us so much. And he's got guardians around us. And they're watchers. That's what they're called, too. The watchers. They just watch. And they watch over. 
and protect. That's why when we pray for another saint or another Kodeshim, uh, Kodeshi, we, uh, we, we pray for the saints. We're actually uh, encouraging Yahuwah in that act of watching over those people and protecting them. And uh, it isn't, uh, every once in a while you'll hear about a brother or sister who has a friend or a relative that's unprotected, possibly unprotected by prayer. And they're attacked and brutally attacked. There was a brother who called us last night who is a longtime supporter of Yahushua's ministry through this particular office. And he said, my son was in a terrible car accident. A backhoe, it was working on the road apparently, hit his car. And it, he would have died if this plastic surgeon, a world-renowned plastic surgeon, hadn't been at the hospital at that particular time he came in. He had esophag esophageal damage. His tongue was disconnected. Uh, there was facial damage of great extent, and uh, but Yahuwah did protect his life, you know, because of his father's sake. But apparently, this uh, individual uh, was protected to the point where he couldn't take Satan couldn't take his life, but he could certainly touch him. And you, you know, there's things that happen that are miracles around the, the Kodashim, the saints. Uh, that they are unaware of, the protection that they have not even known was there, that could have been catastrophic. Mm -hmm. uh, not just accidents, but I'm talking about demonic attack. You know, mm -hmm. there can be accidents, but then the, 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 the demons really hate us. And we don't hate them, we just mm -hmm. ignore them. But we, we don't pray to our protecting Malachim, but we pray to Yahushua. Who will send help? The help, mm. you know. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing. Mm. Yeah, when uh, you speak to clients who are um, about to have babies and things like that, or they've just had a baby, and uh, you hear some of the horrible stories about how much complication there is. It's just such a massive thing these days. Whereas, Amy and I've always had the opinion, well. People have been doing it for thousands, women have been doing it for thousands of years. And uh, we've never had one single drama about anything. And then so you hear these women and they're just massive, massive problems, major surgeries and everything. And, and you think Satan's really trying to get them young, you know. And it's even more heart-wrenching when it's babies, you know. Um, so what you're saying is spot on, like... There's so much protection that we're not even aware of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. All the, uh, yeah. All the uh, nurses and midwives that are clients, they just, they just, they nearly faint when I tell them we just have unassisted home birth. <laughs> <laughs> what if this? What if that? What if this? What? It's fine. No problem. <laughs> you know. So. Mm. Yeah. You who is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. We have a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. And Chris also wanted to let everybody know that the pool lady, the one with the prophecy, finally came into the salon and bought a fossilized customs. Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> so, that's a, another yeah. little bomb that's going to go off in somebody's heart. Mm. Um, he's that's a, amazing. Yeah. He's been trying to, you know, he's been getting the word into all these pool ladies when he goes down to the pool and... Uh, it's all happening over there. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. That's uh, you know, it's uh, and then you know, you never know which one is going to go out, and it's going to become a thousandfold when yeah. that person that reads it will open, and it'll or become a half million. Uh, you never know. These people that Yahuwah uses, he knows where they're going to be and what who they're going to affect, and you know, a lot of times. A person will pick up a book or be handed a book by someone and they'll read a little and they'll go, no. In fact, this gentleman that was in the seminar uh, last weekend, we had the war in heaven. We recorded it, so it'll be soon available. Anyway, watch that on YouTube. Uh, for That might be available in the next week or so if Adam gets it to you. But uh, 
or even days, I don't know. But uh, this gentleman came up to me and he, he's been coming to the seminars for a couple of years. And he said the first time he picked up the Fossilized Customs book and read a few pages, he threw it on the ground and stomped on it. He was jumping up and down on it. Take that! <laughs> Take that lens! <laughs> this is a man that's in his 70s, probably. You know? And uh, he's uh, really... Uh, he's gung-ho. He's all, he's all on board. He loves uh, the truth. And uh, that's a wonderful thing to see. There's people in their 80s mm -hmm. that we talk to on the phone uh, that are just thrilled to, to know... Finally, I've had pastors that are retired that have called me on the phone. And, they, and I, one that I recall was calling me at that at that store. You know, oh, are you store. still there? Come on. <laughs> uh, I, well, you, who wants me to be there? That's and it might be a test in people's hearts too. But they're they're hearing a lot of things that are not true. Yeah. But anyway, the thing is, this pastor called me at that store, and he had me on the phone and. He said, I'm a retired pastor, and uh, I think he was Baptist. And he said, I want to, I want to, I've read your book, huh? and I want to ask you, where did you find this information? How did you find this? This is what I've been needing all my life, and I, I never found it. You know, this oh, was, you know, uh, it seems like it was about seven years ago that he talked to me, and it was really shocking to hear someone that was up in years, that was searching for truth all during his ministry and teaching other people, and yet he had not yet acquired it. There was a seminary student, that or he had just graduated from seminary, and he read Fossilized Customs, and he said that he only got about a third of what he needed from the seminary. And the rest of it, you know, he feels like he was educated and brought forward, but a great extent, to a great extent, by reading what was in there, because it gave him the, the tools to be able to learn more, you know. And I feel like I'm just starting out, too. You know, I, he's teaching me all the time. You know, Yahushua's uh, waking me in the middle of the night. I'm writing down scriptural texts, uh, words, sometimes addresses, like Psalm 91. What would, what would, be, what would Psalm 91 have to do with anything? Well, uh, do you want me to find it? <laughs> Let's do. I, I was writing it down last night. Uh, we were, uh, we could read Psalm 91. Look at this. Um, we have, we, we don't have a uh, famine of the word. No. He that dwells in the secret place yeah. of the Most High, who abides under the shadow of the Almighty, he is saying of Yahuwah, my refuge and my stronghold, my Elohim, in whom I trust. For he delivers you from the snare of the trapper, from the destructive pestilence. He covers you with his feathers, and under his wings you take refuge. His truth is a shield and armor. You are not afraid of the dread by night, of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that walks in darkness, of destruction that ravages at midday. A thousand fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it does not come near you. Only with your eyes you look on and see the reward of the wrong ones. Because you have made Yahuwah my refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil befalls you, and a plague does not come near your tent. For he commands his messengers concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You tread upon lion and cobra. Young lion and serpent, you trample underfoot. Because he cleaves to me in love, therefore I deliver him. I set him on high because he has known my name. When he calls on me, I answer him. I am with him in distress. I deliver him and esteem him. With long life, I satisfy him and show him my deliverance. Whoa, that's awesome. Did you, just so, hear the, did you just hear that reference in your head? Yeah, Psalm 91. Wow. I had to write it down. 
Well, it had to do with today, I guess. Oh, totally. Just last night, I think it was about, uh, seems like it was about three year in, in the morning here. It was in the middle of the night. You know? um, but Psalm 80, everybody needs to read. That's the cry of Ephraim. He wants to, it's a cry that we, we are making to him to revive us, to call upon his name. You know, and uh, boy, we were doing it today. You know, wow, with all these, yeah. what? Uh -huh. See, people have been searching for his name for a long time. You know, and uh, his name is going forth. The the uh, work of Eliyahu or Elijah is 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 actually operating now. I think that the spirit of Elijah is in the world. Mm. There's no doubt about it. And, and it's been taking a few decades <clears throat> to build up because we were pulling ourselves out of the mud, you know, and the crustiness of all this stuff that they've been packing in, all these errors. The translators are in collusion with the adversary. Mm. It's sad. Mm. But we, have, we aren't condemning them. We're just saying that they were deceived people. Mm. Well, Satan's the prince of the power of the airways, but I think through all this modern technology, Yahuwah also has power too. We're, we're getting it for, it's going forth. Yes. Uh, now, let's see. We wanted to talk about one other thing. I've got this big lamp stand here. It's actually a, like a, a floor lamp, and I've got it sitting on my desk. So it's going way up in the air. And I've got this... Uh, Scripture, I've got little scriptures, and I've got on the walls, I've got uh, scriptures and things, just everywhere. Like, there's things on the sides of things, you know, that I put up. Uh, because I, I just love to, when he puts something in my head, I put it up, and I try to remember where I put it. But anyway, there was uh, something else in scripture about the, it, it's called the Aleph and the Ta. In the Greek, it's Alpha and Omega. Yeah. And these are kind of markers that the translators don't know what to do with, but they're there. And they're in relation to the name, you know, and the covenants and things like that that are being made. And uh, back in uh, the, the books of Moshe, you'll see that this little Aleph and Ta are sitting there. Let me see if I can, uh, I can show you what they look like. Hold on. And you'll get to see one of my little sheets. Instead of writing it on my hand, I just write it on pieces of paper. <laughs> anyway, see this letter up here? That's an olive, and that's a ta. You know, and this means uh, ox, and it, by extension, it means strength. And this means a mark, you know, like make your mark, yeah. you know. Mm. When, when a person couldn't read or write, they just make their mark, mm. you know. Anyway, olive and ta. And, of course, uh, this is the Paleo-Hebrew. And this also has a, a look of a, not just an ox, like, a, like a, an ox would have if you turn it. It's our letter A. Yeah. See. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is a T. They call it Ta. Anyway, we, we haven't really gone that far away from it. You know, we just shift them a little and we can see it's an A. But it, it means uh, also, uh, it refers to the, uh, an ox grinding. So if an ox was put over here, and this was the point where the grinding stone is, and the ox was turning around the stone, it also implies strength or leverage. Mm. Strength. Wow. So it has that secondary, you know, meaning. Mm. So this means mark. This means strength, you know. Anyway, uh, Yahusha revealed the meaning of the Aleph and the Ta at Revelation 1, verse 8. He said, I am the Aleph and the Ta, the Almighty. He's identifying himself as being the one that was speaking back in the text. So Yahusha is the same being or person that was speaking in the covenants to Israel and to the fathers, you know, the, the one that, Eliyahu is supposed to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and totally. The fathers. The covenants were made with the fathers, and we're supposed to realize that 
in the last days, mm -hmm. just before the day of Yahuwah comes. Anyway, he called himself El Shaddai. Yahusha called himself El Shaddai. If you read Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he mentions this word, I mean this uh, Aleph and Ta, again in the 11th verse, and in chapter 21, verse 6, and in chapter 22, verse 13. So he keeps calling himself the Aleph and the Ta. And that's for our benefit today to know who he is by identity, linked with the same name that was in the covenants. So he's the covenant person. He's the one, or the being that made the covenants. Yeah. So you is the same being. That's why, that's why we're, it's such a revelation. It's in the book of Revelation. <laughs> That's a big thing, isn't it? There's still it's people, huge. even the brother today, the one who um, asked you where certain parts of Torah talk were, and I sent back a message saying, yeah, yeah, I've, I've fixed it all up. He said, uh, be careful. Be careful of Lou. He's a lovely guy, but he, there's so many texts that state that Yahuwah is not one. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. how many is yeah, I don't get where they get that. But I don't know. I've got to be careful of you now, mate. <laughs> yeah. If I'm telling you you who is one, uh, yeah, you might be in apostasy, eh? I don't think so. Uh, if you just go with that and just say, well, you know, I don't, I, I don't think he's two. He is. He became. He took on the form of flesh and uh, was born like anyone else was. But he was fathered by... Well, you could say himself, but it's it's not uh, it's not real complicated. I mean, Yahusha is the is the one that made everything that's seen and unseen. In other words, he's the creator of the of the fallen Malachim and the and the good Malachim. So you've got uh, the good news is uh, it doesn't matter if uh, you can see something or you can't see something. He created, you know. Mm -hmm. He created the spirit within man, and it was Yahusha that did it. You know, Colossians and Philippians, and there's all these texts that, well, you know, there's actually a study that I did on the uh, uh, topic of the omnipresence of Yahuwah. If if anybody goes to fossilizedcustoms.com and they go to the articles page, they can find an article called Omnipresence, and Yahusha is omnipresent. Mm -hmm. See, if you were to go into a spaceship. And yes. fly out, and know you'll never come back. You'll find him there. You can talk to him. Yeah, you know, that's amazing. Some people won't pray to him at all, but yeah. You know. Well, well it, it, what's the time is it now? It is twenty-four minutes past one. <laughs> then you've got to go to bed. That's how I just do it. I'm yeah. so sorry to keep you so long. Oh, it's amazing. It's wonderful. I've never been to the Shrine of the Museum before. Yeah. Yeah. It's just stunning. Wonderful. It is. Yeah. And uh, there's a well, little, I can't little, wait to see it. Yeah, there's a little bit of a snippet at the beginning too. We're actually going to take a bit of a walk through the bit inside of it too. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we better let you go. Yes. It's well, been we wonderful. Well, and uh, be kind to each other. Yes. You know, and uh, wherever you find your 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 work to be done, uh, don't let critics, you know, go against you. Just uh, just keep doing it and say, I love you. Just keep doing it, you know. And uh, don't be too critical of people. Yeah. Because, you know, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Well, we better let you go. So I'll see you next week. Wonderful, brother. Yeah. Okay, well, we love you. Love you too, mate. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. You have a great day. Toy Talk. Toy Talk.